thank you for having me. Um, which one is the clicker, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw it leaving, so I was like, no. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, it would be a bit of a change of tone in comparison to the first presentation. Particularly, you will notice the difference of there being practically no AI-generated images in here. But instead, there will be just walls of text, uh, which is a way for, I think, the gradual uh, transition to the legal topics to happen because as lawyers we love our words. Um, but yeah, as you can see, that's uh, privacy is the main topic and there have been a lot of interesting things, developments happening in the EU, but in general, generally, but also in the EU around privacy. Um, so I will also uh, spend some time on um, the recent verdict uh, from um, related to the tornado cash um, case. So uh, that might be interesting from a more practical perspective so that you all know basically what's, what the court thinks. Uh, but first of all, just a quick presenta presentation of a few words about the European Crypto Initiative. We are an advocacy organization based in Brussels. So what we do is we try to make the industry um, happen, <laughs> still work, even when there will be more regulation um, and just more rules around that. So one of the topics that we are very, very much involved with is privacy and basically the protection of our data on chain and how that would be then aligned with what's happening in the EU, particularly the GDPR and similar laws. Um, about me, so I'm Viara, I'm a human rights lawyer. I've been working quite a lot on uh, topics such as privacy. Um, I've been actively involved in the Web3 space since 2018, more or less. And currently I'm doing a PhD on this topic. So it's really, you can, uh, th you can say that I'm really involved in the topic of privacy on chain. And I'm um, a senior policy lead with the UCI. So what we'll cover, basically, there's going to be a short overview of the challenges, but I think most of you that are here probably already have an idea that there are challenges between crypto and uh, privacy. And as promised, um, I will provide you with an overview of Alexei's case and some, I would say, practical things that you can take out of that and implement in your work. And then we can discuss the possible solutions that basically it would be the techies around us that would be coming up with them. I can uh, help with like the legal framework um, on how that will happen. And of course we can then discuss. So here is the promised wall of text. Um, I don't know how many of you were yesterday at Lefteri's uh, lecture, but he also, um, when discussing privacy, he was also discussing, yes, there are some issues, obviously, around privacy on chain. So here I am basically providing another source of that information, um, in particular, the European Parliament that, as you can see, that's in 2019. That's one year after the adoption of uh, the GDPR. So they started thinking, OK, maybe it's not really working out. Um, so they commissioned this study, and the study um, pointed out these three main um, issues between privacy and GDPR in particular and DOT. And it's the immutability and the right of erasure. Ba basically, uh, you have probably heard about the right to be forgotten that is now enshrined within the GDPR. And it cannot happen on chain. It's just not how it works. Uh, also, we have the data minimization with the general rule being uh, you only need to collect and use the specific amount of data you need in order to execute this specific task, um, which also isn't how necessarily blockchain works, uh, because you already have pretty much all the data out there, and you cannot just kind of usually choose a specific part to, to use in a specific circumstance. And of course, the identification, which um, it's not that much about how do we identify people that might be anonymous, as I will explain on the next slide, but it's more about determining who would be the controller, because the GDPR has this um, distinction between controller and processor of data, with the controller having the responsibility of everything that happens with the data, and basically you need to be able to pinpoint that specific person. And when you have this chain of people, um, notes, um, it's not that easy. 
So something that um, I will go back to the Lefteris talk again, and I hope you have been there yesterday, but there was this question uh, from the audience after the talk. Um, basically, what is the difference between privacy and anonymity? And uh, here from the GDPR point of view, it's pretty straightforward because you don't need anonymity in order to have privacy. Basically, what's interesting is that actually <laughs> the privacy regulations like the GDPR um, doesn't apply to any data that is anonymous, anonymized, which is great news. Um, but here is the issue that basically all the data that the industry is using, all the data that is on chain, wouldn't, wouldn't be considered anonymous, but instead pseudonymous. Uh, because there is this rule, according to the GDPR, saying that whenever there are tools like such as encryption used to, in order to um, the basically not the list, but to uh, move apart from the information about the specific person. In this case, we have um, a pseudonymized data that can, in certain cases, still be related to the data subject, in the words of the law, but basically related to any person about whom this data is applicable. So in, in a sense, um, privacy laws apply directly to on-chain activities because the data on-chain isn't anonymous, because the, usually. Because the tools that we are using actually still makes it possible for that data to be directly connected to a specific person. And as you can see in the points below, it's just a doxing that's necessary for this to happen. Basically, even if you are anonymous for a while, it's always a possibility that uh, all the connections between all your transactions um, can be made because one of the transactions actually um, doxes you. And that brings a lot of privacy risks. Uh, so um, this is the reason why also the community is thinking about solutions. How do we solve that? So one of the solutions that really was quite popular um, was Tornado Cache. Basically, uh, using a mixer in general was considered as one of the solutions. However, um, there are issues around that. Um, as you probably have all followed, um, one of the leading developers um, was arrested by the Dutch. Uh, he was held in custody for quite some time. And a few weeks ago, actually, the court um, came out with the verdict saying, yeah, he's guilty and he will serve more than five years in jail because of that. So now I have prepared a few slides where I will go through the details so that basically you will understand better what the court is saying and we can then discuss basically what we think. I think we kind of share the same opinion about um, the general um, concept of that, but it would still be interesting to discuss. So um, basically this is the overview and what, uh, what the court kind of wants us to, to uh, really understand is uh, that, you don't have to read all of that, I can circulate it later on, Basically, the court is saying, yes, this is a tool that was created with the sole purpose of laundering money. And here is where basically the issue comes because no, that's not the sole purpose. The purpose is to actually, for us as crypto users, to have anonymity. But that's a different topic. Um, and yeah, they're saying, yeah, it's like normal that criminals abuse that because that's the purpose, basically. Um, so I'll walk you through. Um, I don't think it's going to be as interesting as a procedural, procedural series on TV. Um, but usually when there is a court case, like a criminal court case, you have the prosecution on one end, that's the state that is bringing up the, like, um, the crime claiming the claims about the crimes and um, kind of putting a list of evidence that it truly happened. And then there is the defense side. Um, so the defendant and the defense lawyer, usually. I mean, there are probably a group of people in that. And, but that's how it usually uh, works. And of course you have the judge that its sole purpose is to determine who is right and who is wrong. 
and who is guilty and who isn't in this case. So um, the public prosecution, when bringing up this case in front of the court, were saying the following, um, claiming uh, that by developing, offering and improving, this is a pretty important part too, the Tornado Cash Service, they concealed or disguised where the crime-related ether mentioned in the indictment went, where they came from and who was the owner of the ether at the time of the deposit and collection. To which the defense basically responded. Uh, the intention of Tornado Cash as developers was never to break the law or facilitate criminal activity. And here I will just bring your attention to the um, word intention, because when it comes to criminal law, criminal cases, the word intent and intention always comes up, um, because that's part of it. Basically, proving intention is very often part of proving that crime even occurred. Uh, but intention is also a spectrum, so you don't have just one pure intention, I want to do it, but instead there are different categories, so you'll see how that matters in just a, a brief few slides. Um, so, intention, intentionally, and then they um, add, Tornado Cash is therefore a privacy tool that aims to meet a legitimate need, what we discussed basically. It is up to the user not to misuse this software for illegal purposes. Bringing, of course, uh, the oldest comparison is, it's not about having, like, producing a knife, it's about how you use the knife, as we know. And they add that the technical properties of Tornado Cash make effective action against abuse impossible, basically bringing forward the argument that it's code, it's how code works, uh, you cannot stop it. However, the court start like what the court usually does is they go through all the arguments and are saying, yeah, that's true, no, that's not true, um, by using legal arguments usually, if it's a good court. So they're saying the following um, on the can either even be laundered question, they're saying, well, there is this court case about uh, Bitcoin, so we kind of feel that it's the same. Um, because here it's important what would fall under the objects category. So basically they're saying, yeah, just like Bitcoin, Ether are cryptocurrencies, digital monetary units that represent a real value in economic transactions that are subject to human control and that are transferable. So basically saying, yeah, you can obviously launder um, this type of asset. And then there's the second argument also by the defense uh, saying, yeah, but how can he launder something that he cannot have access to? So the court is saying, well, as a matter of fact, you can. Um, saying that the le uh, legislative history, again, that's some old court cases, and the law also shows that it is not required that a suspect has the object of money laundering in his possession or under his control adding that under certain circumstances, someone can be guilty of this who does not actually have the object in question under his or her control, saying practically, yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you can still launder it even if it's someone else's, um, in someone else's possession. So um, then the court went, went even deeper, analyzing, okay, how, how do we actually um, prove that there was this um, direct involvement by um, the Tornado Cash and the Tornado Cash quote-unquote team. So the defense um, is saying again, well, it's not like a criminal operation. It's actually only um, the users of Tornado Cash that can be uh, found guilty of money laundering because of the uh, end of the day, it's those specific subsection of uh, users that were laundering money that are the money launderers. But the court does not agree, saying, well, to Tornado Cash makes it possible to make completely anonymous deposits into a withdrawal from the Tornado Cash. It also hides or disguises who has the actual power of disposal over the cryptocurrency, or in other words, who has the cryptocurrency at hand. So then, it, based on that, it makes 
um, the following um, argument that Tornado Cache cannot be seen merely as a tool for the user. So this is where basically the defense argument, uh, according to the court, uh, falls short. Um, the fact that Tornado Cash does not at any time have control over the cryptocurrency resulting from crime when carrying out the concealed or disguised money laundering acts does not alter this. So this is pretty important and um, it's fair to say that it's going to be important for other similar cases as well, unfortunately. And even more, uh, here that might be even more interesting for developers as well because they're citing the use of GitHub and one can fairly say that similar repositories as an indication for this connection and for the intent of committing this crime. Uh, so they're saying, yeah, and they also put this GitHub page um, and also analyzing who were um, adding the most information, who are the uh, biggest contributors. We also see that Alexei was among the top three. So here you can see this direct connection um, according to the court between um, Alexei and what is happening. And even more so, they're pointing out yeah, that he actually built some of the most important functionality on there. So you have the uh, source code for the uh, pools, the UI and the relayer software that directly uh, come for, from him. So this is basically enough for the court. And here it's also not just Alexi, but there are two co-suspects. Um, so they're saying that, yeah, all those people um, as the founders, um, they basically also um, behaved as basically the board of Tornado Cash. And here you can see this traditional connection because Oh, it operates, so obviously it needs to be a company uh, and have a board. So the court is trying to kind of use this um, way of thinking, this box. Okay, so who is in control of this company? So uh, according to the court, they indeed acted like a board of directors of a company. And they even presented that, and that's pretty important, up to the media. Basically, they spoke uh, representing Tornado Cash to media outlets. This is kind of connected also to their image as leading voices in this um, company. And again, mentioning company, um, it's, uh, they also, the court also mentions how they continuously developed the tool. So here it's also about um, the um, rolling out in f uh, phases and making available of, of the two and different uh, additions. This one is very, um, I think, crucial. So nowhere in the verdict uh, it is being mentioned as, yeah, we are actually arguing against the code is law uh, argument, but it's pretty obvious. Basically, the court is also mentioning that the fact that it's an autonomous, unchanged and unstoppable, um, and that's the nature of smart contracts, it does not exhibit uh, the criminal, basically doesn't remove the guilt of the perpetrator in this case. After all, that is no coincidence, and that's pretty interesting. Basically, the court is saying it's no coincidence that this person chose to use a technology like that, that is irreversible in its nature. So it won't be very realistic for this person to claim that, oh no, I, I now cannot stop it. So basically that's the opinion of the court. Of the court. And continuing with like the more TRADFI uh, point of view, uh, it says, yeah, Tornado Cash works as designed. And the suspect can therefore be regarded as the perpetrator of the money laundering acts carrying it out by Tornado Cash. And here you have this, who is running the company? What did the companies to do? So yeah, obviously the person that 
uh, provided that would be responsible according to the court. But it's very interesting basically saying, yeah, the code is low, but you are the one choosing to use the specific code um, as an argument. And this one as well, um, because we are all kind of um, looking at the concept of progressive decentralization as a way forward, uh, including myself. That's, I think, really uh, what, what the steps are. Uh, but here the court is saying, okay, you created a DAO, you created a decentralized autonomous organization, but that doesn't change anything. Um, so there, the specifics are very important, of course, but they're saying, okay, so you're a, we're a bit too late in doing that because when you actually made that change, um, the most crucial parts of the code were already out there and the decisions were made. So basically you created the DAO but you couldn't reverse the decisions made previously that were the problematic decisions. So that's A. And B, basically they're saying, okay, you created a DAO, but you um, distributed the governance tokens in such a way that it still may ensures that the people that are the board of directors of this company have full control. And they're saying, yeah, they are, um, like they have, all 30% of all the torn tokens in distribution. So basically saying that's not really decentralization in a way, which is also interesting now that we also have to think about how to interpret Mika and what is decentralization. Unfortunately, this court case might be useful in that regard in interpreting what um, might be decided in these situations. Um, so yeah, it's about control in this case. And again, coming back to intent, uh, because this is criminal law, of course, we have to also prove that uh, if we are a court. Um, so first, the court is talking about the connection through the interest. And again, it's bringing up this new token, uh, governance token uh, that was issued and basically saying, yeah, Torn actually incentivized further Alexi to uh, go on and build this criminal tool um, because now there was a direct way of monetization of the usage. So that's A, that's the kind of intent plus um, interest in the outcome basically of the crime. And then we have the um, argument by the court that um, the suspect had at least a conditional intent here we are coming back to like the spectrum of intent. Uh, so conditional is somewhere like here, and the uh, foo I want to murder someone is here, uh, but still it's intent. Um, to launder the ether um, mentioned in the indictment. So in the indictment they are uh, li they have listed. If you read the whole thing, which probably you shouldn't, but um, they are list they have listed all the um, hacks. Not all, but some of the major hacks basically that um, occurred and that were later um, the, the amounts of it went through uh, Tornado Cash. So the court is further saying the suspect participated in various chat groups in which the content of the articles about the, the hacks uh, was discussed and the fact that cryptocurrencies with a criminal origin were deposited into an Edu cache. So basically he knew or should have known based on that information and he did nothing. That's what the court is saying. Um, so yeah, Tornado cache, in other words, he was aware of the significant chance of that happening. And here, yeah, what is said is that if he didn't want it to happen, he should have stopped that. Which again brings us to the point that they don't really understand this, do they? Um, further on, that may be also interesting from a practical point of view, but Tornado Cash tried um, to solve this in a sense by integrating a compliance tool, I think with chain analysis. Um, but basically what the court is saying that, okay, this is good <laughs> in a way, but that's not enough because it didn't stop um, the transactions that were the problematic ones and the perpetrators that were the problematic ones from using the tool because they could have just skipped this part. So it was only useful for the 
people whose transactions were actually okay. <laughs> um, so basically what the court um, makes uh, as an argument is that the development of the compliance tool does not show that the suspect did not accept money laundering by Tornado Cash, but instead the compliance tool is useful for the user with legitimate in intentions, but it does not impose any restrictions of the user with illegal intentions. So it's basically they're saying that's not enough. Um, and something else that I think a lot of projects are currently doing is um, they go to lawyers and they ask for legal opinions. Which legal opinions? Some of the cases are saying actually your type of work uh, does not fall under this description of a regulated service. So you probably don't need this license or you don't need to oblige by this uh, law. So uh, that's what um, Tornado Cash developers did. And they received apparently um, an advice, an opinion, saying that actually um, you don't fall under the FinCEN, that's the American um, basically regulation. Uh, so there's not any obligation to incorporate compliance measures, to which the court is saying something very interesting, basically saying it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's saying, however, whether or not Tornado Cash is fi financial institution, which is um, apparently what they asked about um, and what they uh, received in the opinion, um, that must ad adhere to compliance regulation is not important. But instead, the important question is whether the suspect and his associates com complied with the law. Adhering to compliance rules helps prevent violations of the law, but not being subject to compliance rules does not absolve from the obligations to comply with the law. This is very catch-22, I think, um, as you can see, because basically whatever you do, you can be wrong. Um, but what they're saying is that even though you have received this opinion um, that you might not be um, under this regulation, it might not um, have any impact. Um, so, yeah, and this is the most important part. I went through it, so for the newcomers, uh, here is the um, overview, basically, of the Alexei's court case. Um, so basically, the court is saying, this is a tool for crime, uh, and this, all of those things that they used as arguments um, prove that. And what is interesting is we did some analysis um, and talked to some people. And basically, there are some countries that also the lawyers from there are saying, yes, our system would have said the exact same thing. So for example, in France, um, going through like all the details that we have under the Dutch case, lawyers are pretty certain that, yes, this is what could have happened there as well. So uh, the next wave, basically, of similar court, ca court cases might uh, be in the making, unfortunately. And yeah, they're not saying uh, the knowledge plus them not doing anything to assist uh, is enough for this um, uh, argument to be made that this indeed, indeed would be tried in the same way. And that what they did was too little too late. So I promised that we would also talk about solutions. Um, so they, they should come from people like uh, creating them. That's um, what I can be useful for is saying that some things might not work and some, some things might work. Uh, something that I saw that's more related to the decentralized front ends topic, and I'm not <laughs> against this project, I think it's pretty dope, uh, but I'm more against the, the way uh, it's uh, being communicated. So in any case, whenever you're doing a useful tool, don't frame it as something going against a regulation because that might backfire at some point, even though obviously that's the point. Um, so what are the solutions? Would that be one of them? That's the privacy pools concept by uh, Vitalik. Um, why not? It's yet to come. Also, the GDPR is uh, going to have a facelift probably um, in, the, in the next few months, a year. So we are also, as, an, as the European Crypto Initiative, are quite involved in those discussions. And yeah, with that, thank you.
I don't know if there's time for questions, but yeah. So yeah, w great question. Um, we have recently started following the court cases because there weren't any <laughs> previously because that's just developing now. So now we're also responding to those. Uh, but what we do is we discuss the regulation when it's in its infancy uh, in front of the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council. So uh, we started as a reaction to the MICA markets in crypto assets regulation. We were like, no, uh, the industry needs to have a say in this. So that's when we uh, gathered as an organization and started responding and basically helping the regulator also understand what is necessary not to destroy this um, industry. Uh, so we are just dealing with the problems as they come. Mika, uh, we have also the AMLR, anti-money laundering regulation that is completely not fit for uh, for crypto. We also have obviously privacy, but uh, other topics as well as infrastructure, front end, so forth. Uh, so yeah, we are kind of developing as the need and the industry is also developing. We started as an advocacy organization, but now we're also shifting in watching this type of things happening.